Hello and welcome to Beyond the Charts. This series is where we break down what's happening in the world of finance and economy through charts in a way that's easy to understand. For all the charts and sources mentioned in this video, don't forget to check out our newsletter. The link is given in the description below. Now, global uncertainty is on the rise. From new US tariffs to fiscal strains in advanced economies, but India so far has managed to hold its own. In this edition of Beyond the Charts, we'll take a look at some insights from RBI's September Bulletin and some interesting charts on the Indian economy. Let's start with India's economic growth. Both reports converge on one theme. The economy is being driven from within. In the first quarter of financial year 2026, GDP grew at about 7.8%. Now, most of that came from private consumption and fixed investments. To explain that in simple terms, people are spending more on goods and services and businesses are putting more money into factories, housing and infrastructure. On the other hand, trade dragged growth down. Since imports were higher than our exports, we can see this in India's Purchasing Managers Index or PMI numbers too. The high frequency indicators tell a similar story. GST e-way bills, power demand and toll collections all grew strongly in August. But there's more to these numbers than meets in the eye. Now, part of that growth came from festive stocking, wherein companies started moving goods early to get ready for the upcoming festive season, when demand usually jumps. Now, another factor here was that exporters started rushing shipments ahead of new US tariffs. They were trying to soften the impact of higher import duties by sending goods before the hikes took effect. Now, shifting to demand patterns, there's a clear change. Demand in rural India is picking up again. We had also discussed this in the previous edition of Beyond the Charts. Tractor and two-wheeler sales rose in August. More farm jobs opened up with Kharif sowing and demand for Mandrega dropped. Good rains and healthy reservoirs supported sowing and also helped keep food prices in check. Urban India, on the other hand, looks weaker. Car sales were modest and domestic air travel actually fell. That's the opposite of trend which we saw from 2021 to 2024 when cities were driving growth whereas villages struggled with high inflation. Now let's take a look at the employment trends. The unemployment rate fell to about 5.1% in August, which was mainly because the urban unemployment dropped. More people are joining the workforce and hiring is steady in areas like technology, insurance, hotels, outsourcing and also real estate. Business surveys also show that companies are still adding workers in both manufacturing and service sectors. When we look at India's trade with the rest of the world, which is what economists call the external sector, the picture is quite mixed here. Now, on the goods side, India usually runs a deficit as imports of oil, electronics and gold outweigh the exports. But in August though, the gap narrowed sharply. At 26.5 billion US dollars, it was much smaller than the 35.6 billion US dollars deficit a year earlier. Exports of engineering goods, petroleum products, electronics, gems and jewellery and pharmaceuticals all rose, while imports fell in gold, coal and transport equipment. Now, oil imports did go up, but not enough to undo the overall improvement. Now, services are a whole different story. India usually earns more from services than it spends which is mainly because of the IT and business outsourcing. In July, net exports rose to about 10.2% year-on-year to about 16.4 billion US dollars. Now, mind you, imports also grew, which was mostly from the travel and royalty payments. But the surplus stayed strong, just as it has since the mid-2010s. But the RBI still warns us that the weaker global IT spending, automation and tighter visa rules could put this cushion at risk. Let's now take a look at inflation. The consumer price inflation in August was just about 2.1%, which was comfortably below the RBI's 4% target. On the food side, the picture was mixed. Prices of cereals, fruits and milk cooled, while vegetables, pulses and spices were still in deflation. Apart from which, fuel inflation also eased. Electricity and kerosene got cheaper, even though LPG prices remained high. On the other hand though, Core inflation, which strips out food and fuel, tickled up slightly to about 4.2%. Now, that was mostly because of the higher gold prices, even as inflation in housing, clothing, health and transport softened. But the RBI warns us that risks aren't gone. Pulses and onions are still volatile. High frequency data already shows that cereals are picking up in September and higher wages could add to cost through what it calls second round effects. Now, in other words, the headline number looks calm, but for households, kitchen bills still feel heavy. 
industrial activity is holding firm. The eight core sectors grew strongly in August, with steel and coal showing double-digit gains. Cement also rose, and electricity remained steady. The manufacturing PMI even touched a 18-year high, which is a clear sign of infrastructure build-out. But the RBI clearly points out that much of this momentum is coming from government capital spending, while private investment still hasn't fully returned. Now let's turn to services. Services are doing well too. The services PMI climbed to its highest level in 15 years, with air travel, commercial vehicle sales, digital payments, rail freight, and port cargo all expanding. Since 2020, services have been the most reliable driver of growth. But because they depend so much on urban incomes, they always remain vulnerable to any slowdown in jobs or wages. Let's now take a look at the financial system. Bank credit growth eased to around 10% year-on-year in early September. Retail loans like housing, gold, and personal loans remain the main driver. Now, credit to services was also strong, led by trade and real estate. MSME credit grew in spite of industrial lending still being patchy. Deposit growth, on the other hand, slowed a bit to about 9.8%. On external flows, though, FDIs touched about 10.7 billion US dollars in April to July, with July alone hitting a 38 month high of about 5 billion US dollars. But most of this came from one big services deal and not a broad surge. Now, foreign portfolio flows remain volatile. August saw equity outflows on tariff years, but debt inflows after India's credit rating upgrade. Now, by mid September, overall flows turned positive again, which were boosted by the debt inflows after the US Fed's rate cut. Reserves remain a strong cushion. At about 703 billion US dollars in mid September, they cover more than 11 months of imports and 95% of external debt. We see that the RBI has dipped into them to smooth rupee volatility, but the buffer is large enough to absorb oil shocks or sudden outflows. Now, the flow of funds shows us how India's financing model is shifting. Let's break this down. This is about where businesses get most of their money from, whether through bank loans, markets, or any other overseas sources. In financial year 2025, bank lending slowed with non-food credit. Now, these are loans that banks give to companies and households, which were down by about 3.4 lakh crore rupees. But the gap was more than made up by non-bank sources, which rose by about 4.5 lakh crore rupees. Together, total money flowing into the commercial sector reached about 35.1 lakh crore rupees. We can clearly see that markets are now supplying nearly as much finance as banks do, which stood at about 14 lakh crore rupees when compared with 18 lakh crore rupees. In financial year 2025, companies raised about 14 lakh crore from the markets when compared with 18 lakh crore from banks. Now, how exactly did they go about doing this? Equity fundraising surged as companies sold new shares. Corporate bond issuance grew as interest rates eased, which made borrowing cheaper. Commercial paper, which refers to short-term debt issued by firms, also saw a revival. And while smaller in size, REITs and INVITs, which are used to fund real estate and infrastructure, added steadily to the pool as well. Now, foreign sources are still an important piece of India's funding story. Most of this comes in the form of FDIs, which refer to foreign direct investment. Now, these are long-term investments by global firms, which consistently make up the largest share. ECBs, or external commercial borrowings, and short-term trade credit play a big role here but they are much smaller when compared to FTIs. Now, where does this foreign money exactly go? The breakdown here shows that services dominate FDI inflows, taking close to about 40% in 2024 and 2025. And manufacturing, of course, comes next, with about one-fifth of the total, while energy, retail trade, and construction each take smaller shares. For external borrowings, companies in manufacturing are the largest users, which is followed by power, transport, and communication. The takeaway here is that Indian businesses are no longer dependent on bank loans as they once were. Markets and foreign investors now provide a large share of funding. Now moving on to non-banking financial companies, which are also referred to NBFCs, which are almost like banks, are also seeing lower loan growth. Now loan growth slowed to about 15.4% by the end of 2024. 
which was after the RBI raised risk weights on unsecured lending. And as a result, unsecured loans now make up a smaller share of their portfolios, which is down to around 24%. Now, on the funding side, NBFCs still rely heavily on the banking system. Banks and debentures together make up to about 73% of their borrowings. On the lending side though, the credit is split with industry loans concentrated in the power sector and retail lending spread across housing, vehicles and consumption. The sector is also in a far better shape than it was back in 2018. Gross NPAs have dropped to about 3.4% and net NPAs have dropped to about 1.2%. Now the capital buffers are high and liquidity coverage is well above the regulatory norms. But still, RBI warns us that microfinance NBFCs and fintech-focused lenders are the most vulnerable if credit conditions tighten. And finally, let's now turn to government spending. Central capital expenditure has climbed to about 3.1% of the GDP in financial year 2025, which is the highest in decades, with roads, defense and logistics leading the way. The RBI notes that this spending has been more front-loaded, with more funds released early in the year to push activity. Looking at the data, infrastructure growth has generally moved in line with GDP growth in the recent years. Now, both GDP and infrastructure growth slumped during the COVID-19 shock, but bounced back sharply around 2021 and 2022. There's also a clear pattern here over time. When government capex rises, GDP growth tends to improve later. That's why policymakers today are leaning so heavily on public investment as a growth driver. The challenge, however, is sustainability. Pushing capex higher with limited space risks, swelling the deficit. Meaning that while public spending can keep the growth rate going, it cannot carry the burden alone indefinitely. So the story across all these charts is very clear. India's growth today rests on people spending more, businesses investing, services firing, banks and NBFCs holding steady, and record government capex. The weak links are trade, food inflation risks, and the fact that private investment still hasn't fully joined in. Now, India may be holding its ground better than most of the countries out there, but the real test here is whether these domestic engines can actually keep running. That's it for this edition. Thank you for watching. Do let us know your feedback in the comments below.